Welcome to the Miraculous Mamas podcast. I'm your host, Elizabeth Joy, and we are back in 2022, guys. It's weird because every single year, I can never write the date right. You know, like when the new year changes, you're always like, crap, what's the year? And you're writing the last year. But the last two years, I have. I think just also because the last two years have been such a crap storm (laughs) that you're ready for the next year to start. Like last year, I was like, 2021, no prob. And this year, I had to write a couple of checks. I was like, 2022, no problem. Like, I don't know why. Some For some reason, it's just coming easier. <laughs> we did take the last couple weeks off, enjoyed um, some really good time with family over the holidays and just Vito and I have been working on some house projects, mostly him working on house projects. Uh, and we're just trying to soak in some time together as a family. And I am trying to like get as much time, I guess, with Jovi before the new baby arrives. I'm due in a couple months and I feel like this pregnancy has gone really slow. Um, It's gone slowly. And now that there's a couple months left, I'm like, holy crap, the next two months are going to fly by just because we have a lot going on, not tons going on, but just uh, my birthday's coming up and then Valentine's Day, then our anniversary, and then basically I'm due a couple weeks later. So, uh, and we just have a lot of things that we want to do around the house before the baby comes. We're trying to, we're going to move Jovi into a new room. So I want to get that kind of redone and set up. Um, And then we're going to keep the nursery, the nursery, because with our last baby, we didn't find out what we were having. So everything's gender neutral in there. It's super cute. The walls are kind of a a soft green and it has um, like animals and it's kind of a jungle theme, but like not hardcore, but just really simple. Um, So we want to keep that room, the nursery, since we don't know what we're having again. And then I'm going to make her room just a little more girly and... I'm going to be working on that this next month. And I have just like a lot of random things like uh, doing my recertification for my doula, um, my birth doula certification. I got to get that done. I got to, what else? (laughs) Oh, I'm working on an awesome course that I'm really excited about, um, the Ultimate Birth Plan Prep course. Um, Because I'm just realizing, talking more and more to people, how passionate I am about birth plans, not because plans go according to plan, but because the list of things in your birth plan is actually what's going to educate you on your options. That's what's going to help you be completely informed and educated and prepared for anything going into it. Uh, And that's what I'm finding I'm just super passionate about and... um, and you knowing your rights and, and birth and, and labor. So I'm working on that. Vito's working on some cool dad stuff, uh, helping educate fathers for birth and just not even just birth, but preparing to try to conceive conception, pregnancy, how to be like supportive to your partner during pregnancy, how to be a good birth partner during birth, uh, and, and all of that. So, um, He's he's working on some of that stuff. So we're really excited. I feel like, like I said, the next couple months are going to be jam-packed and then the baby's going to be here and then I'm going to have two kids. So that's crazy. <laughs> we're like, what are we doing? Um, but I feel like it's it's going well. My pregnancy is going well. I still am having some sciatica issues, lots of acid reflux Um but besides that, and, and I'm doing all the things, public floor therapy, chiropractic care, started working out again, um, doing different stretches, breathing things, bouncing on the ball, uh, making sure I'm staying hydrated. Uh, so yeah, in the next couple of months too, as I get prepared for my birth, I'm going to be sharing some tips on here. Like I did before, I had Jovi just going over some of your options Um, some things that you can do to help set you up, uh, different things that can happen, how to prepare. So I'll be doing little, uh, inserts on here either before the interviews or, uh, maybe after, or maybe a couple episodes of just all that stuff, talking to somebody about it. And, um, 
yeah, I'm getting all, all ready. You guys can get ready with me. I feel like I know so many people having babies right now, just even in our Facebook group or listeners and people I know here, like tons of Vito's family members or my friends, everybody's getting pregnant and having babies. Um, so it's fun. I get a lot of questions. Hey, what should I do about this? And I love it. I love it when people reach out to me. Um, so if you guys have any questions or anything, make sure you reach out. Let me know what you want to hear in this new year. We're still doing a rebranding change that hopefully will be coming soon. Uh, there's just a lot of back end things that have to happen before that, that goes down. So that's why it's taking so long. And, uh, yeah. So make sure you guys reach out. Let me know who you want to hear from, what you want to hear. And we're going to do our best to make that happen. I'm so excited for today's interview. Uh, I'm interviewing Dr. Stu and it's all about breech birth. And I am fascinated by this topic topic because it's also one of my fears going into having a baby is what if my baby flips breech? Because where I live, there's not a lot of options. There's probably two doctors uh, within driving distance if I go into labor that might deliver a breech baby. And if you're switching to the practice last minute or late term, you don't know. They could be full. They might not be taking patients right now. Um, and it's illegal for midwives here to deliver breech, so, which it's not in other states. Um, in California, it is. It's pretty crazy in California, actually. They have super strict laws about it. Um, but we're going to get into that on the podcast and why that's kind of ridiculous because a lot of other high income nations do vaginal breach deliveries and they have no difference in fetal outcomes versus us doing majority cesarean. So it's not like the cesareans saving the baby because the fetal outcomes are pretty much the same in the countries who do vaginal. Uh, so it's, it's super interesting. We get into the medical system and how that's affecting everything. It's some things are kind of out of a doctor's scope. Like even a doctor here is just talking to somebody the other day and we were going over doctors who deliver breach in the area. And I'm like, I heard this person does it. And she was like, yeah, but he got in trouble with the hospital. Like he, he's not allowed by hospital policy to deliver breach, although he's fine with it. So there are doctors who will do it, but, or are willing, willing to, but the hospital is not allowing it. So the whole topic goes way deeper than just, Hey, doctors don't want to deliver breach because that's not necessarily the case at all. So, uh, it's super interesting. I have Dr. Stu on, he also has his own podcast, uh, which I'll link all of that information. Um, he's, he's, he's just a wealth of information. Um, not just for breach, he does, you know, home birth, twin birth, and he's an OB. So, um, he's been in the field for a lot of years and I'm super excited to dive into this topic with you. So we will get to it. All right, everyone. I have Dr. Stuart Fishbein here and I'm super excited to talk to him because we are going to talk about a topic that we never have before. And that is breach birth. I know so many people listening have had this come up for them uh, and weren't really given any options on it. But Dr. Stu here delivers breech babies. And so I'm so excited to pick his brain and to um, just get some information from him about why this started, why this is happening, that nobody's getting options and just kind of the physiological um, breech birth and what that looks like and how it could be possible vaginally. So thank you so much for taking the time to come on the podcast. Thanks. It's a pleasure to be here, Liz. Um, I'm happy this is a passion uh, of mine, um, breach and twin birthing and, and bringing back common sense to to my profession, which has lost it <laughs> for the most part, right? So I'm here to o- uh, openly talk about any way you want me to go. And if you want me to just, you want me to wing it, I'm happy to just go off on a tangent and wing it. So. Yeah. Well, let's just start with the different kinds of breach birth, because I think a lot of people... Um, may only be familiar with like the butt first, right? Frank breach. That's kind of like what you see most common. So I'd love for you to just kind of talk about the different types of breach birth. um, And if there's one that's like way more high risk than the other. Okay. Let's back up for just a second and just tell you that about three to 4% of term babies, term being beyond 36 weeks or so, uh, are going to be breach, Right. Anything that has three to four percent of some uh, of some population is not abnormal. 
It's a variation of normal. And it should be treated as a variation of normal. It's not a disease. It's not something that's wrong <clears throat> with your pregnancy. There are certain reasons sometimes you find why babies will be breech. Commonly, well, of the reasons you find, by the, the most common reason a baby's breech is unknown. But for the reasons you find, it could be that there's a slight anomaly of the uterus, something wrong with the babies ne- neurologically, but not something significantly wrong, just something or the baby doesn't move as much, but I think it's just a variation of normal and not a abnormality that doesn't really have a lot of effect. There are different, depending on which experts you talk to, they may give you different explanations, but ultimately it really doesn't matter. So about three to 4% of babies are breech um, at term. The most babies who are breech at term are going to be in the frank breech position, which is where the, the butt is down The hips are flexed and the knees are extended. So it's what we will call the diving pike position. If you you think of the Olympics, that's sort of how they do it, where the feet are up by uh, by the face. Second most common is complete breach. Complete breach is where the hips are flexed and the knees are flexed. So the baby's sitting sort of in the somersault position or the squatting position, that sort of thing. And that makes up most of your breach, breach babies at term. We're not talking in our discussion today, we're going to limit ourselves to term breaches. We're not going to be talking about preemies. So those are the two most common things. Occasionally, you'll have one leg up and one leg down. That's called an incomplete breach. And sometimes you'll have the cord presenting, which is called a funic presentation, which is a problem. And that baby should be delivered by a cesarean section because that is the problem. But when the butt is down and well engaged into the lower uterine segment, the, the risk of the cord falling out, as some doctors will say to people, um, is this no different than if the baby's head down? Mm-hmm. Kick off 2022. Does it feel weird to hear 2022 <laughs> with a better checking account with no monthly fees? Chime, an award winning app and debit card, has no overdraft fees, foreign transaction fees, monthly fees, or service fees with over 60,000 fee free in network ATMs at many locations like most Walgreens, 7-Eleven, CVS. You can access your money when you need it and where you need it. You can also send money to anyone, even if they aren't on Chime, fee free for you and no cash out fees for them. Make your first good decision of the new year and join over 10 million people using Chime. Sign up only takes two minutes and doesn't affect your credit score. Get started at chime.com slash mamas. That's chime.com slash mamas. Banking services provided by and debit card issued by the Bancorp Bank and Stride Bank NA members FDIC get fee-free transactions at any MoneyPass ATM in a 7-Eleven location and at any Alley Point or Visa Plus Alliance ATM. Otherwise, out-of-network ATM withdrawal fees may apply. Sometimes pay anyone instant transfers can be delayed. The recipient must use a valid debit card or be a Chime member to claim funds. So, uh, but those are the two most common kinds of breaches. And uh, again, uh, there are certain criteria that if met with a breech birth, that the safety of breech birth is going to be no different or no statistically different than a head down term pregnancy with the same uh, healthy mother risk factor type things involved. And I can go somewhere down in the discussion today, I'll go through those with you. I don't want to get ahead of your questions, but um, so the frank breach and the complete breach are the two most common. It used to be that complete breach was the one, the desired breach for breach practitioners because I think because it was a, we had a very hands-on approach. We're talking back in the 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s um, where if the, once your foot was out, you could actually pull the baby out. Um, when the baby comes out butt first, you can't do that. Mm-hmm. So... Frank breach now has become more uh, of the desired uh, uh, position, mainly because uh, of the hands-off technique. And and people are afraid that when a foot comes out, that the baby is what's called a footling breach. And that's something we don't want to have happen because that would mean the foot has come out through an incompletely dilated cervix and you don't want that to happen. But all complete breaches, when the mother is pushing, a foot will pop out first. Mm -hmm. So you just need to know and you need, and the most important thing in all this thing is having a skilled practitioner supporting you. Right. Which is kind of the problem, I guess, with today is that 
it's breech birth is like an art, how to deliver a breech baby that's no longer taught. So I was saying right before we got on the podcast, like I, I live outside Chicago. There's only a few providers in Illinois that deliver breech babies. Right. So that's like a fear of mine. I'm pregnant right now with my second. I'm like, what happens if this baby flips? I'm not at one of those practices. And um, I'm birthing at a birthing center this time. And it is illegal for my midwife to deliver a breech baby there. So yep. I'm <laughs> stuck without options. And I want to know yeah. why doctors aren't taught this anymore. Okay. Well, first of all, should it be illegal? No, it shouldn't be illegal. But, uh, but, but government ag- uh, legislatures take their advice from, from academic physicians. And academic physicians are completely misguided on this topic. And in my opinion, and I know this is, sounds sort of harsh, but they are destroying the, um, the profession because the only reason to have an obstetrician, the, one, the thing that makes an obstetrician unique from any other specialty is the ability to do things that no other specialty can do. Mm-hmm. And that would include like a breech delivery or a second twin breech delivery or putting on forceps. The academic residency programs are not teaching these skills anymore. So the residents coming out of training now are not trained to be obstetricians. They're doctors Mm -hmm. and they can do C-sections really well, but that doesn't make you a a specialist. And so it's very frustrating for me to see an obstetrician who has a mother who's got twins, for instance, and says to the mom, well, if if your baby's both aren't head down, then you'll need to have a C-section because we can't deliver a breech second twin or even a breech first twin for that matter. That person should, in, in those cases, not be doing twins at all mm-hmm. because they're not a twin expert. And yet, because they're labeled as OBs, they do twins and they just offer this one skewed point of view of a, of a cesarean section. And, and with twins, you know way ahead of time. With breaches, you often don't know until the, la- the latter weeks of pregnancy or even sometimes spontaneous in labor, you'll have a surprise breach. And if you don't know how to do a breach delivery in those particular scenarios... It's going to lead to more problems because everyone's going to be at some point in their career thinking their baby's head down. And then when the baby starts to come out and you start to see meconium and a foot pops out, nobody's going to know what to do. They're all going to panic and they're going to try to take you back into an emergency C-section when a couple simple pushes and maybe some simple maneuvers would have had that baby out in a minute or two. Mm-hmm. And, um, but they don't know what to do. And so the question you ask is why don't they know what to do? And that's, that's a very complicated question and I thought about it a lot but it doesn't start with the term breach trial which was a paper that came out in 2000 Mm -hmm. which everybody says was the paper that put the nail in the coffin for breach birth and that may be true but breach birth was already on the um, down the down slope uh, in the 80s and 90s uh, because of some papers that came out that found that outcomes might be better for babies born by cesarean section versus breach. But in those papers, they're all flawed. And they're all flawed because they compare the standardized cesarean section outcome with a non-standardized breach baby, breach deliveries, which may or may not have been planned or unplanned. They could have been skilled or unskilled. The fetuses could have had anomalies or not had anomalies. There's no cohesion. There's no, there's no consistency in any of those studies. They're all flawed. Mm-hmm. And they also make the mistake of comparing vaginal breech birth, which is not standardized, to standardized cesarean section. What they should have done, and what a lot of studies have done since, is compare vaginal breech birth outcomes to cephalic vaginal outcomes. And they find that there's not significantly much difference between the two. The Royal College of OBGYN has the best numbers on this, and they've rounded them out. And, of course, the, the end point that medicine always looks for are the, are the worst end points, like stillbirth. Right. They don't really care about patient satisfaction or, you know, the baby, how's the baby bond with mother or how's mother's breastfeeding or what's the mother's outcome in her future pregnancies or the mother's side effects from the unnecessary cesarean section. Those things aren't considered. Most of the time, all they consider is um, stillbirth. So the stillbirth rate in, a, in, in the Royal College's numbers is about one in 500 with a vaginal breech birth at term. Okay. And the stillbirth rate with cesarean section for breach is about one in 2,000. 
So people can say, oh, my God, there's a four times greater risk of stillbirth with a vaginal breech birth than with a cesarean section. And that could be statistically true, but it's, but it's mathematically inac- inaccurate because, um, first of all, you shouldn't be compa- comparing the two that I've already discussed, those two things. You, look at, you should also look at head down and what's the stillbirth rate at head down. And that's about one in a thousand or, or breaches about twice as um, risky as that com- comparably, comparably so. And I know this sounds like a lot of numbers and a lot of weeds, and some people are going to get lost in this, but let me simplify it because this makes it very clear. Relative risk doesn't mean anything when you don't know what the denominator is. When you look at the denominator, you find out what actual risk is. And the actual risk of not having a bad outcome with a breach borne by cesarean section is 99.95%. And with a vaginal delivery, it's 99.9%. And with a breach delivery, it's 99.8% of not having a bad outcome. If you ask somebody, what's the difference between 99.8 and Mm 99.9? Most people are going to say, not enough to make me want to have a cesarean section. Right. Right. So how data is presented and the confirmation bias of those presenting it is what leads us to the position that we're in now. Mm -hmm. And the ignoring of the data, the recent data, you, you mentioned to me before we came on air about a lot of the data now showing that there's really no difference. And that's correct. Mm-hmm. Almost all the studies that have come out since the term breach trial and much larger numbers of patients involved have shown that the risk uh, is really statistically no different between um, breach babies born by cesarean and breach babies born vaginally with very small risks to both. Mm-hmm. So... Um, They ignore those papers because it doesn't fit the model by which they want to practice. The model by which doctors want to practice is they want the baby in the bassinet uh, crying. And how it gets there is really not their concern. And I'm not talking about individual doctors and I'm not not, um, vilifying any particular people. I'm talking about the system and the system. We're all stuck in a system. You know, doctors don't want to hurt people. But the system sometimes makes it so that doctors have no choice. They're not given um, all the options because they're not on the formulary of the hospital or the hospital doesn't allow certain choices. So how do you counsel a patient about all their choices when, when if the hospital doesn't allow it and you counsel them that they have that choice, the hospital is going to get mad at you. Mm-hmm. And, you're gonna, and if you're an employee of that hospital, it's going to be even worse because you could lose your job. You know, as many doctors who pre- prescribed ivermectin while working for hospitals for the COVID thing lost their job mm-hmm. because they were prescribing or hydroxychloroquine, they were prescribing medication that is off label, but, indi- but, but a FDA approved and they lost their job for that because the hospital didn't want them to do it. So it's the system that's broken and the system leads us to the point where, you know, for financial reasons, for medical legal reasons, for economic reasons, uh, expediency reasons. It's easier to schedule a C-section at 7.30 in the morning on a Tuesday and be in the office at 9 o'clock than it is to have to sit with a breech baby because the hospital has a protocol that if you're going to do a breach, you have to be in the hospital the whole time for 14 hours for, and getting paid the same from the insurance company. Mm-hmm. So all the incentives are backwards to doing it. And the only reason, as my friend Elliot Berlin likes to say in our documentary, says the only reason is to satisfy the, the desires of the mothers. And do and do essentially what's ethically what's ethically right. Yeah, I love Dr. Berlin. <laughs> um, Have you seen the Heads Up documentary? No, I haven't. Uh uh-uh. uh Okay, it's called Heads Up: The Disappearing Art of Breach Delivery. Oh, and for any of your it. listeners who are interested in it, I think they can get it at headsupmovie.com or on the resources page on my website at birthinginstincts.com. They can they can find it. I think there's a four ninety nine or five ninety nine fee to watch it. But yeah. Um, it's worthwhile, especially if you have breach, but it's just worthwhile anyway, because it sort of explains in very simple terms why breach went away and why it shouldn't have gone away. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to take a quick break. If you've listened to the show for a while now, you know that I'm obsessed with playing Best Fiends. <laughs> and right now it's kind of needed. There's so much like holiday chaos and it's nice to have a little pick me up when I need a break from all of the holiday action. Uh, Best Fiends is a unique gameplay that has it all. A storyline, collectible fiends, tons of fun prizes. You can connect with your Facebook friends on there, do little competitions, do some side puzzle solving, which is what I love to do. Uh, And 
even if your holiday travels take you off the beaten path, you can still play Best Fiends. There's no Wi-Fi required. It's also always challenging, which is something that I also need as a mom. Sometimes you just need a little action for your brain when you've been hanging out with a one-year-old all day. (laughs) So it is my go-to. Download Best Fiends free today on the App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R, Best Fiends. I feel like you brought up so many interesting points. Like I like the I like the research because I feel like as a doula, that's where I get like upset because <laughs> I've been at births where scare tactics have used like your baby is 12 times more likely to die if we don't do this thing right now. I'm like the actual numbers go from like one to one point, whatever. You know what I mean? Like, it's like you yeah, have one to one in a million know. to one in 500,000 or something like that. Right. right. And it's like, you need to know the actual numbers to know if this is actually a risk for you. But when you're being told your baby's going to die, like if we don't start you on antibiotics because your water's been broken for 12 hours, you know, or like we need to get you into um, a C-section because your water's been broken for 24 hours and your risk of your baby dying is like out the door. It's like, well, let's look at what increases that risk. It's because they're doing cervical checks every hour to see if you're progressing. They're doing all these other things. What does the actual research say? So I love that you were talking about that because that's something I'm passionate about. Like I want people listening to feel informed and to actually know the information, to know the numbers so they can go equipped to their part, to their appointments. Because for me, the biggest thing that... I tell people, if you want to have the birth you want, it's choosing the right provider. You have Mm -hmm. to find the right provider that's going to support the plan that you have. And um, unfortunately, there's not a lot of providers that support breach birth. No, there's not. And that's why I think I would encourage everybody who can to go through the midwifery model of care first. I mean, and and, and there are red flags when you have a practitioner and an OB. And you may love your OB. He may be a good person. She may be a great person. She may have done your birth control and pap smears for a decade and you really have a relationship with her. Maybe she did a cervical biopsy on you. Maybe she did a lot of stuff on you and you, and you trust her. Doesn't mean she's a good obstetrician. And one of the red flags that you need to look at is how they, how they give information. How much time do they give you to ask questions? And do they say things like the risk is high mm-hmm. or, um, or do they plant seeds of doubt in you early on? Do they say to you, well, you know, you're, you're only four foot 11 and your husband is six foot two. That could be a problem with your pelvis or, you know, you're over 35, that whole stuff. So for, for your, for your lay people listeners, I mean, you want to be able to ask the doctor what the relative risk is. What's the act, not, not what the relative risk, but what the actual risk is. When he says something is high, ask him, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. Or when they say something is risky, ask him, well, what does that mean? And then they'll say, well, it's just, it's risky. And they'll say, well, how risky is it? And they'll go, well, it's, too risky to take a chance and they they because the the actual answer is they don't know right and it's not that they're stupid they're not dumb they they, they're very smart people they just it's not on their radar screen to look this stuff up and they don't have the ability a lot of them to admit that they don't know it takes a confident person to admit that they're that they don't know something yeah and a lot of my colleagues are not confident when it comes to obstetrics they're scared because that's the that's the model by which they were trained in Right. Is that pregnancy is an illness with something waiting to go wrong as opposed to uh, the midwifery model, which is pregnancy as wellness, where, you know, it's natural, it's natural, but only occasionally does something go wrong. And things, as you said, are more far, far more likely to go wrong in the medical model because the medical model intervenes in everything that everything that they do is an intervention. My colleague Bliss on our podcast said something once that stuck with me forever. She says, even walking in the room to talk to a pregnant woman is an intervention. Mm-hmm. because you would never do that to your dog or a horse or a deer. Well, you would never birth. walk up to them. <laughs> you would never approach them and ask them questions Yeah. or, or do anything. All that thing, it, it disturbs the process. Yeah. So, you know, back to breach, they don't know how to do breach. They weren't trained how to do breach or they've had a bad experience with breach or they've been told of a bad experience. And therefore all the incentives are not going to inspire them to go out and learn to do breach delivery. Mm-hmm. It's not going to happen. If they don't learn it in training, they're not going to learn it outside of training. There's too, many, too, many, uh, uh, too much liability, too many factors involved that they're not going to go out and try to do something they've never done before in, in practice, which is a shame because in residency, it's where you're supposed to learn the skills that make you an obstetrician. And the fact that my academic uh, colleagues are not teaching it 
is 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 you know it's wrong it's just wrong it's i don't even know what word to use it's it's a tragedy that they're that they're not being taught how to become what they're calling themselves if that makes any sense yeah it does and like you said i mean it goes back to the system which i mean is a whole i mean that presents a lot of different issues when it comes to the birthing world if you look at our outcomes versus other high income nations um that actually do use the midwifery model of care as the entry level um and then if you if there is something high risk or something that needs monitored then they're referred to like an ob um so that's that's super interesting that you're such an advocate though for the mid, mid, midwifery model um when you are not a midwife well yeah i've evolved i mean i didn't come out of my residency thinking like this i mean uh, it's a people have heard me speak before and know that know this sort of story but you know i came out of my training um, thinking that I knew everything about birthing and uh, I knew everything about high risk birthing or almost everything. I didn't know everything, but I knew everything about high risk birthing and I knew where to look it up or where to, who to refer to or anything like that. But I knew nothing about normal birthing. Re- residents don't come out, of, come out of training with knowing anything about normal birthing. Um, or again, I, that's a little bit hyperbole. They know very little about normal birthing because when a woman is laboring normally in the hospital, how often does a resident actually see that woman? Mm-hmm. Not very. <laughs> None. They're called to catch the baby. Yeah. And write the orders. That's what they're called. And they, sometimes they miss the delivery. They just, they're called to write the orders or do some stitching or something. But that's, that's what they're called for. They're never watching a woman labor. They don't know about the sounds that they make in early labor and the sounds they make in transition and the movement and how important movement is. Because mm-hmm. almost all women are restricted in movement because they, we have to monitor the baby. We have to monitor the baby. Well, why do you have to monitor the baby? Well, something might go wrong. Well, the baby's been in your uterus for nine months unmonitored. Mm-hmm. Why do we think that suddenly something's going to go wrong in that last period of time? It's because you're in the hospital now and, you're the, and the liability belongs to the hospital. And the hospital is, and the medical model has brought up unreasonable expectations of perfection, which then lead to this cascade of interventions that, that start with just like we have to put you on a monitor. Right. That limits movement. When you, you, when you limit the movement of a mammal... You limit their ability to deal with discomfort. You limit the ability to them to assist the baby to rotate or move or whatever. And so you end up with occiput posterior babies, which is babies looking upward. Yeah. Or you end up with um, people requesting an epidural because they can't get in water. They can't get on all fours. They can't use a rebozo. They can't get a massage. They can't get their hips squeezed. They can't do the things that other mammals might do, like pace or squat or kneel or Mm-hmm. whatever, when you have discomfort, they, they're not allowed to do it because they have to be on the monitor. This whole monitor thing was one of the huge things that happened in the early, I mean, I think it was seventies that it happened. And it took our C-section rate from 5% in 1970 to well over 30% now in, right. in 2021. Yeah. I was going to say that there's research that shows that the continuous monitoring has increased the cesarean rate, but it has not increased or has not benefited fetal outcomes. It's not right. Like, the rate of cerebral palsy is, is, if anything, slightly higher now, but it's certainly no different. Right. Than, it's not like it w- saving babies, but causing less And yet it's not getting, they're not getting rid of it because it's, a, it's, a, it's become indoctrination in the hospital to use it. And it's a time saver and it's a labor saver. And so they use it and it makes, it, it makes a documentary record for the risk management lawyers to have, you know, because that's what's important about when you're in labor is having a documentation for the risk managers, mm-hmm. not the mother. Right. You know, not 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 the moment yeah i mean i i people don't know me by now and i and i do this a lot i have a bit of a cynical side and i and i (laughs) and and forgive me for that but when you say when you say the same thing over and over again and nothing changes all right either someone in someone is insane because that's the definition of insanity right right (laughs) trying to believe it's not me i think it's the system yeah well i remember hearing um I'm a big fan of the evidence-based birth podcast and I listen to Dr. Rebecca Decker on there a lot. And she was saying in one of her episodes that it takes about 20 years of something. Like if there was a study done right now about breach, vaginal breach birth being completely safe, it would take 20 plus years for it to actually start happening. Um, And I feel like I've seen that as a doula. Like I started practicing in Vegas in 2012. And at that time... I'm in Chicago now, so I don't know what the providers there are doing 
Not one of my patients, not one of the providers would allow delayed cord clamping. Not one. And I'm like, this is crazy. Like, and, and but then when, once I moved to Chicago, they were actually doing it here. Um, but when I was in Vegas, like every single one of my births, they put it on their birthing plan and not one provider would do it. Um, which was just like super interesting to me that. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's one of the fo- most foolish things you can ever think of. And you even, there's a, I don't know if you've seen it now, but there's a, um, there's a video going around Instagram. Yeah, about I saw it. The one, the one minute cord clamping or the blood will flow out of the baby backwards. Back into the placenta. Um, yeah, it's going around. It's, it, 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 it's a perfect example of the idiocy of what pe- some people think. So only in the human species do we need to cut a cord to prevent the blood from flowing backwards. Right. All right. Nobody, no other, no other mammal ever has its cord cut by anybody ever. Mm-hmm. Right. And the blood doesn't flow backwards out of the baby. So the idea that someone said this and it picked up and you, you know, it's really interesting. You said it takes like 20 years, about 20 years for a study to sort of pick in. That's true. If the study is commonsensical. Right. Right. But when the study <laughs> is absurd, sometimes it can be adopted right away. Like the term breach trial, which I mean, like I said, the trend was already happening, but it confirmed it and it was boom. And then just a couple of years ago, we had the ARRIVE trial. I was going to just say the ARRIVE trial. That was like a huge one and everyone wanted and for, to be induced at 39 weeks. Yeah, for your listeners, that's the trial that they, they, they just wanted to see. You know, they, a, a few years before the ARRIVE trial, there was a debate at the ACOG meeting. And I watched it on, um, on, on video in those days. It was back east. And it was a debate is supposed to be between two people who generally have opposite positions on something. Wouldn't you say that's like what a debate is yeah. for? Turns out both these guys were in favor of the 39 week induction thing. So, and then, and then lo and behold, like two years later, after the ACOG introduces us at one of their meetings, there's a paper that comes out that confirms that 39 weeks is a good idea. Okay. But not looking at their endpoints are essentially um, terrible endpoints, not looking at anything about the journey or the mother's the bonding with the baby or the mother's well-being or psychological well-being or the mother's future babies. None of this stuff matters. It's all robotic. It's all gets back to my, my premise, which I developed this year, which is that the medical model sees the process as only having one result. And that's a baby in the bassinet and how it got there doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's part of the problem is because that the medical model doesn't see mother baby as a unit. Right. Once the baby comes out and the cord is cut, the baby belongs to the pediatric department. And so the doctor's obligation, the obstetrician's obligation to that baby is over. All right. And then he's just got the mother. Where in the midwifery model, mother and baby are always together and they're always considered as a unit. And the midwife's responsibility is for both of them. And that makes much more sense. Yeah. Yeah. It definitely does. Um, so since it's kind of like a systemic issue that's happening here, I mean, is there anything that we can do at the lower level to try to get this to change? Um, honestly, um, I think that midwifery is the future of obstetrical care in this country. Mm-hmm. I think people are beginning to, fi- to beginning to find out. I mean, there was a 70% increase in home births last year, supposedly, probably because of COVID. Yeah. Now, that sounds like a lot, but let's not screw our numbers <laughs> right. up. It went from like 1% to 1.7% right. of all the births. So it's not a lot, but it's something. But people are beginning to understand and they're beginning to see that they're getting gaslit by the medical profession in many a- aspects of what's going on. And, that you know, it may have taken COVID to wake up wake up the um, the, the, the mothers of America. So... Because midwives have an intellectual curiosity, they want to learn it. Residents have an intellectual curiosity, which is stifled by their academic, academic proctors, preceptors. So maybe when those people leave and a new set of, of leaders comes into our profession, we might see a change. But with the current leadership in, in place, you're not going to see a significant change in that. And, and with the certain financial incentives, I mean... One of the things that could change the way we give birth in this country would be immediately to pay half as much for a cesarean section and twice as much for a vaginal birth mm-hmm. for an insurance company. You'd find that doctors would suddenly think that VBAC and breach, you know, not such a bad idea. Maybe a vaginal birth of twins. I get paid twice as much as if I do a C-section. Maybe a, But right now, the medical model uh, honors surgery more than it honors uh, 
patients it takes to deliver a baby vaginally. So they pay more for surgery than they pay, uh, you know, especially to the hospitals and institutions. They make a lot more money if they have surgery and the, or if the baby gets in the NICU than if the baby doesn't. So the, it's, it's, it's perverse. It's sort of like hospitals were incentivized to diagnose people with COVID, even if they didn't have COVID, or even if COVID had nothing to do with the reason they're in the hospital. You know, you hear about the kid, you know, kid that's killed in a motorcycle crash that died of COVID, mm-hmm. all right, because um, – the hospital got paid more, you know, gets paid more money for that. When you put for these perverse incentives in and you realize that the people running hospitals, their fiduciary duty is not to the individual woman or client or patient or doctor or nurse. Their fiduciary duty is to make the hospital profitable. So they, their ethical obligation is not the same as mine or your ethical obligation as a doula. Mm-hmm. It's not the same. And so the forces are, are, are pushing against it. So we've, we've, we've kind of got off the track of breach. I'd like to talk about some of the, the beauty of breach delivery and the simplicity of breach delivery. Yeah, I would love to dive into it. Right. Oh, okay. So you asked about breach delivery, why I do them. I mean, breach deliveries are, 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 are fantastic. And a good meme that I have is that breach babies will uh, deliver vaginally. They'll succeed or not succeed for the same reason that head down babies do. Mm-hmm. Um, Arrestive dilatation, fetal intolerance to labor, uh, um, and, you know, the, the normal things that cause a head down baby to end up with a cesarean section. People don't know that. But breech birth babies, different from head down babies, is that when, the, when, a, when a mother is laboring with a breech baby, the breech baby will tell you how it's doing. Not only will it use its heart rate to tell you that, but you expect to see meconium. Meconium in, in the lay world and often in the academic world is like, oh, meconium means fetal distress. Mm-hmm. It absolutely couldn't be further from the truth. Yeah. You know, it's like all elephants are mammals, but not all mammals are elephants. Mm-hmm. Babies with fetal distress will often pass meconium, but passage of meconium does not imply that baby has fetal distress. And in a breech baby, it's sort of like a tube of toothpaste. You know, the baby, as it comes down, gets squeezed and the, and the meconium gets squeezed out the baby's butt and the baby's butt happens to be the presenting part. So you see this toothpaste like meconium. Many of us have done a delivery. You've probably been at some of the deliveries where baby comes out head down and the baby comes out and right after the baby comes out comes this big blop yeah. of meconium. And that was all squeezed out of the baby like toothpaste, except the baby was head down instead of butt down. So we see that. Then when babies begin to protrude, they actually, by their, by their rotation, the babies have cardinal movements. Most people know what the cardinal movements of a head down baby is. It's like, you know, engagement, internal rotation, descent, external rotation, whatever it is. And then um, extension and then rotation again. And that's the cardinal movements of a head down baby. I probably got that all wrong. I'm just rattling stuff off. <laughs> but um, with breech babies, they also have cardinal movements, which, which are not taught in residency programs about watching a baby baby as they come out they almost all emerge sacrum transverse which means the baby's butt is to the one of the mom's legs and then the baby rotates to where the um butt rotates toward the mom's pubic bone and the baby's tummy rotates them or the mom's rectum which we call tum to bum and when babies do that you can actually you actually know that their arms are in a good position in front of them and the arms will come out with either a little bit of assistance or depending on what position they're in they're on all fours they'll come out all by themselves and then the head will usually just follow by itself. Sometimes it needs a little a maneuvers. And so learning your maneuvers for these things, which is a course that I treat, teach called my reteach breach course, or that my friends, Rick Safries and David Hayes have their breach without borders course for practitioners. You could take it as a two day course. Part of theirs is online. Mine's in, per, mine's in person. Um, it's two, I do two days and we use, we have lectures and simulators and videos. And within two days, most midwives who take my course We'll know more about breech birth than any person who's finished their residency in, in four years of residency. Mm-hmm. Because, and they'll know what to do. And I've get, I get letters not infrequently from women who, who babies were surprised breeches. And they said, well, my midwife knew what to do because she, she, she took Rick's course. She took my course or she, you know, it just was, or she was trained by, uh, by a, a skilled midwife in the pre- apprentice model. And she knew what to do. And so it's passed down from, one generation to the next generation until what happens is the, is the, the doctors get metal, start meddling with the legislatures of different States, making it illegal to do it like it is in Illinois and in California. Mm-hmm. Up yeah. until 2014 in California, midwives could do breach delivery. 
Yeah. I'm not sure about the home birth um, here in Illinois, if home birth midwives are allowed to do it. You have to be a CNM technically. Yeah, to, I'm pretty to sure those CNMs aren't allowed to do breach deliveries. Okay, because so. I just know the birthing center that I'm at, they're not. So No, and, um, and CNMs, CNMs um, are, have strict strict rules about what they can and cannot do because they're, they're trained sort of, they go to nursing school first. Right. And then they become mid- nurse midwives. So. Right, yeah. So, I mean, it's pretty, it is pretty crazy. Like, um, but I mean, I just love how you're talking about like, I mean, it's a whole different art, like I said at the beginning, right? It's the art of delivering a breech baby and knowing what the norms are, what that looks like. This is a normal breech baby. This is how the normal, you know, the normal movements or different things go. And, um, And one thing that I was, when I was preparing for the podcast was like, it was talking a lot about vaginal, how there's not that much difference between vaginal birth and cesarean birth when it comes to the breech outcomes if you have a skilled trained professional who's doing it. Yeah, there's, there's almost no difference. And, it, and interestingly enough, it's funny you should say that, but it's because the worst injuries in the term breach trial were to babies born breached by cesarean section. Mm-hmm. Because if you don't know how to deliver a breech baby vaginally, you still have to deliver a baby, a breech baby through an incision in the mother's abdomen. You still have to know the maneuvers to deliver it out. And if you don't know the maneuvers, you end up tugging or pulling or, or, or pulling an arm against the grain and you can break a bone or you can traumatize the neck or the shoulder or the brachial plexus. And you get these nerve injuries and stuff that you can, that can happen in any birth, by the way. They're rare. Even in head down bursts, you see that with shoulder dystocia and other things. Yeah. So it's not something that is you know, uh, attributed just to the position of the baby, but you need to know what to do. And again, even if they don't want to do them vaginally, they should, they should take a course in the maneuvers of how to deliver a breech baby because by cesarean section, you still have to deliver a breech baby, Mm -hmm. but it's a shame that they're not teaching it because it's beautiful to watch. It really is. It's, it's one of the most amazing things. And I've been doing it now for, I'm in my uh, 36th year of private practice by my 40th year, my, actually my 44th year since I started medical school of, of doing this, but I don't count medical school because you don't spend much time in OB in medical school. Mm-hmm. But from 1982 until now, I've been doing, I've been doing this and, and I'm, it's still amazing to me, especially with the hands-off techniques now that we tend to use when women are on all fours, mm-hmm. the babies will just, you just watch them come out and you can tell, they'll tell you if they're okay. You look at their color, their tone. Are they doing what we call tummy crunches? You know, was their heart rate good going into that second stage or that, that the end of the second stage? Mm-hmm. If they haven't been having variables or deep D cells or tachycardia, which is where the heart rate is really high going in, then you've got, you know, there's no rush to get the baby out. You've got, you've got time to let the baby out. But you, but you know if you have the skills that at any time when the baby starts to show signs that it needs help, that you can go in and help it and you know you're going to get that baby out. Mm-hmm. Well, you've talked a lot about hands-off delivery. Um, there was a method taught for delivering breach that was extraction. Yes. Um, can you just touch on the difference between those? Well, when, when a standard teaching for breach up until the last four or five years in most training programs was women delivered babies on their back, mm-hmm. which by the way is probably the position where your pelvis is the, is the narrowest. Yeah, It's sort of the worst position to be in, but it, it's, it's it can more convenient for the the birth team, I guess, to have your legs up in stirrups and they have access to your, your vagina. But it's not the best position to deliver in. Although some women actually prefer it, and I'm not condemning the position, because I would say almost half of my breech moms who start pushing in all fours end up not wanting to be on all fours anymore. So they get tired or it's uncomfortable, or they're not pushing well. Um, but uh, what was the question? I forgot. I got carried oh, away. Um, extraction versus hands-off. Oh, right. So when a woman's on her back, then you don't have gravity working for you. So you end up having to do some maneuvers to help get the, you know, the arms out sometimes. And then, of course, if the baby's in trouble, then you want to, you, you can, once the baby's hips are protruding, you can actually do certain maneuvers to get the baby out just by getting your fingers into the joint of the hip where the hip flexors are. But these are skills you need to have on those rare occasions. And also, more importantly, for, the, for a second twin, um, you know, a first twin comes out head down and the second twin is doing fine for a while and say all of a sudden the heart rate drops to 80. And you look at, you know, maybe you have an ultrasound or you examine it and all you feel is an arm 
or a leg or a cord or a, you don't feel a head and there's, and the baby's not close to being out, but the heart rate is down. So what do you do? You don't call 911 or you don't, you don't rush to get a scalpel, which is what they may do in the hospital setting because they don't know how to get a baby out vaginally, even though a baby has just come out 20 minutes earlier from the same vagina. And, you know, they don't know how to reach up because they're not taught, reach up and grab the baby's feet and then just pull the baby down. People sometimes say, well, why don't you grab the head? Well, you really can't grab the head Mm -hmm. because then your hand is in the way. It's kind of like trying to get a pickle out of the pickle jar by putting your whole hand in the pickle jar and holding on to a pickle. Yeah. You can't get the pickle out. You know, you put your two fingers in, you can get the pickle out, but, or you tip the jar over. But same thing, you can't grab the head and you can't grab an arm. Mm-hmm. But if you grab, if you find the feet, you grab the feet, you pull the feet out, and then you know your maneuvers and you get the baby out in a matter of like 10 seconds, 15 seconds, you can have a baby out. Um, it's very straightforward to, to do these sorts of things. Very simple maneuvers of all the things that we do as obstetricians, it actually isn't that complicated. Mm -hmm. And then, and, and when babies don't deliver because they don't descend anymore or the contractions space out or whatever else from the home setting, what we would do is we would then tell them, you know, I think you need to transfer to the hospital. Unlike a head down baby who might be going to the hospital for an epidural and some Pitocin, a breech baby, no mom knows she's going in for a cesarean section. Mm Mm-hmm. And so smooth transition is always important. Yeah. And a lot of hospitals freak out when you say the word breach. I have a funny <laughs> Kaiser story one time where I had a woman who was completely dilated and she'd been pushing for like three hours and there was no descent and I heart rate was fine. She was beta strep negative, all that stuff. And I started giving report to the nurse and it was kind of like, I don't know if it's Charlie Brown's school teacher where it says womp, 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 yeah, yeah. Womp. yeah. And she didn't hear anything I said. The only word she heard that the whole thing I said was breach. And she, she said, she's breach. And I go, yeah, baby's not going to fall out. Baby's fine. But they panic because breach is a trigger for them. Yeah. You know, it, we all have our, you know, triggers. It, this, this is called a sort of, it, it's sort of a premature cognitive commitment. Uh, they've been told that breach is dangerous. They may have experienced a bad outcome with a breach baby. They may have had, a preemie breach with a trapped head. Um, and there's nothing worse than that scenario. Um, and so it's traumatizing. And so the minute you say that word, people think that the baby's going to fall out and we have to do a section before the baby falls out. But when we transport somebody, it's not because the baby's about to fall out. If the baby's about to fall out, we wouldn't be transporting. Them. Mm-hmm. Right. I think that that's another um, misconception is like transfer rates to hospitals with home birth because like, most people think that this person's dying and so they transferred. And it's like, that's usually not the case <laughs> at all. Most transfers are peaceful. Um, and it's, it's like a completely, like I, one of my friends yeah, transferred most, and it most was. Most transports normal. are non-emergent is what you're right. trying to say, I think. And, and it's really rare for a 911 call to occur. And then when it does, it's usually after birth yeah. um, for bleeding or hemorrhaging or the baby's not re- you know, responding to or, or transitioning well. So, um, but, uh, a transport in labor is by car and it really, other than the fact you've been laboring longer at home, it really, I like to say is no different than if you were planning a hospital birth and you started laboring at home and you labored at home for a couple hours and you called your doctor and your doctor said, okay, time to come to the hospital. Mm-hmm. So you pack your bag, you get in your car, you drive to the hospital, right? That's no different than if you've been laboring at home for 10 hours and or 15 hours and you've been pushing for two hours and nothing's happening and the baby's not in any trouble you pack your bag you get in your car you drive to the hospital yeah it's no you park your car you walk in through the you know through where you know whatever the hospital you go to has whether it's triage or through the er or right up to labor and delivery and you walk in and you say yep here i am my doctor called ahead and you know it used to be we'd go with them yeah that's clearly if that's changed because of the uh the lockdown rules. So. Right, right. Yeah. Um, I'd love to touch on, um, is there anything that we can do to prevent having a breech baby? Well, from my perspective, why would you? Yeah. Um, but I understand from everybody else's perspective. Because a lot of my moms, when they know they have an option for breech delivery, say, well, if my baby's choosing to be breech, why would I force it to do anything else? Mm-hmm. But for those people who don't have a choice, like you in your area, mm-hmm. stuff like that, yeah, then, then um, 
when you get to about 37 or 38 weeks, the key, first of all, is to making sure that someone has diagnosed you as breach and not missing it. So making sure that your person puts his hands on you or, you know, a lot of doctors use ultrasound instead of hands these days. I don't think that that's necessary, but so be it. You're not going to miss a breach if you're using an ultrasound. But uh, to diagnose a breach, if you diagnose a breach at 36, 37 weeks, even 34, 35 weeks, what you can do then is you can begin to put them on the path to, you know, these, all these things that people do when they have a breech baby, which are pretty much universal. They go to Spinning Baby's website. Mm-hmm. They go to a chiropractor for Webster technique. They see an acupuncture for that and for moxibustion. They do inversions at home. They maybe get in the swimming pool and do somersault. All, there's a whole list of things that we tell people to try to do to get the baby to turn. Some babies will turn on their own. Some babies won't. In first-time moms, it's more difficult for a babies to turn when they get toward term because mom's got more muscle tone and uh it just you know especially babies in the frank breach presentation or babies with an anterior placenta they want they they're not going to turn they, they pick that position for a reason or by accident and then they got stuck there you know sometimes the cord could be wrapped around an arm or a leg and keep them from turning and the, it's not it's not dangerous it just keeps them from turning but we you can never really know why a baby's breach i think we talked about it at the very beginning that unless the mother has like a uterine anomaly or something which is much more prone to be a breech birth, it's just so, some sort of a random event. But if your only choice is um, a C-section and all the other things you've tried to do have failed, then you can consider doing what's called an external cephalic version, which is a test done. But you want to be sure, uh, how do you know the skill of the person doing it? I'm not sure there's any good way to know that. Hospitals do a very medicalized version of it. They sometimes... Uh, Well, they give you an IV and they often give you something called tributylene, which is the medicine that makes your uterus relax. And sometimes they'll even give you an epidural. Um, And there's some papers out that show that use of epidural does improve success rate. But I I find that to me, um, when I'm doing a version, the main reason I stop is because it's too uncomfortable for the mother. Mm -hmm. And if she has an epidural, then she's not going to be able to tell you that. And then you might be pushing too hard and might do something to the baby or the placenta that you don't want to do. Um, so it's, it's, you know, external versions, sometimes they're easy and they're especially, they're easier in women who've already had a baby or two because their, their abdominal wall is softer and you can, it's easier to move things around. And the success rate in those moms is probably 60, 70%. But in first time moms, you're talking 20, 30% maybe. So you need to have other options. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, as we've talked about through the whole uh, podcast is that these options are not being taught or they've been removed. There are hospitals that actually have breach bans, even if they have a doctor there who's willing to do it. Right. The hospital has banned. That's one of the reasons in my whole process of leaving the hospital world, that was one of the um, things that they had a breach ban that I sort of, I sort of violated a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen, I gave, I told my patients the hospital bans breach and they came in breach in labor. And I said, the hospital wants you to have a C-section. And my patient said, no. And I said, well, what am I supposed to do at that point? Right. And then, you know, their response is, well, you didn't counsel her properly. If you didn't get the result we wanted, then your counseling was faulty. Right. I see that a lot in my doula work with, um, same, like just if, like I said, I've been at some births where there's been some scare tactics used, but it's like not actually giving this person a choice, you know, and, and you need options. And I know for me, I don't know how I would feel if I had a surprise breach baby going in and all of a sudden being told that it was C-section, I, I feel like I would turn around and go have the baby in the parking garage because I'm like, I don't know what to do. Like it, I remember at one point, cause I had my baby in 2020, they didn't know if they were allowing partners. I had my first baby in the hospital, um, with the midwife group that I've worked with the last couple of years. And, um, that, but it wasn't their policy, the hospital policy that for COVID, like if I tested positive, my partner, my husband was not allowed in. And I'm like, I'm not giving birth without my husband. Like <laughs> I told my midwife, I'm like, if I test positive, I'm turning around, I'm going to the parking garage and I'm having my baby there. And she's like, I'll join you there. It's okay. And I'm like, okay. Cause I'm like, I'm not going through this. And I just feel for these people who haven't had any options. And I feel like one of my fears is that the baby's going to turn surprise breach and I'm going to have zero options because it is illegal for anyone here to deliver it unless I'm already with one of the few providers in the area that delivers breech babies. Yeah, and you know what? I mean, again, I, it's going to take a grassroots movement from the women of your, of your state. 
you know, politicians are cowards. Yeah. The term political leadership is an oxymoron. Mm-hmm. Kind of like military intelligence was jokingly a, a oxymoron for years. But, but political leadership is because is, is, they're cowards. And they go whichever way. They put their finger up and it depends which way the wind is blowing. And, but, and they, ne- they really don't want to piss off a constituency that's half the state, yeah. which is women. Right. So what they do is they don't tell you you can't have a breach delivery at home. They tell you you can't have anybody skilled to be there with you. Right. It's a crime for a midwife to come and help you. It's not a crime for you to do it yourself. Mm-hmm. How does that make any sense whatsoever? Right. Okay. But they don't have the guts to make it a crime for the women of Illinois to go to jail because they had a home breach birth. Right. By themselves. Right. Because they don't, because they don't. So women need to understand they have power. And, they, and I don't know how you organize with pregnant women. It's kind of like organizing cats because you all have to, once you, when you're pregnant, you're, you're, not, you don't, you're not in the mood. And when you're postpartum and you're nursing and you have a baby, you're not in the mood. So, you know, how do you, how do you organize people who have so many other important things to be taken care of? And that's a problem. And so the status quo remains because it, it's, it's apathy. It's not, it's, not, um, it's not shameful apathy. It's just... Yeah. You, you know, you, you, you have to put pressure on it. You have to get people in positions of power to change the, to change the rules, yeah. change the laws, mm-hmm. and to let people have more, more uh, individual freedom. Yeah, I, I'm grateful for you coming on and talking about this because I just feel like there's so much with breach birth. And like you said, I just feel like everything comes back to the system with so many things. Um, but I think even just the people listening, just having some peace of mind, knowing that It's very possible that it's physiologically normal to have a vaginal breech birth and and to maybe encourage people to look for options in their area. Maybe not just taking the, you have to have a C-section route. Um, Yeah, you know what? I mean, the, the last thing I'll say, because time is limited, is that, you know, giving, um, the birth of your children is a life event of, of, of huge magnitude. And to, to delegate that off to somebody because you have blue shield and you just have to go and this is where you have to go. And you would never do that. I mean, I'm not going to get into the analogy that bliss gets with weddings, but, but Mm -hmm. if, if you would never have your wedding at a venue you didn't like, and you would never wear clothes you didn't like, and you never invite people you didn't like, you would never do those things. And your wedding is also an event of enormous magnitude in a woman's life. Mm Mm-hmm. But with birth, we just abdicate all that responsibility to somebody else. Maybe if you find out your breach and there's nobody in your community or your hospital that will do breach, maybe you'll have to travel. Maybe you'll have to drive to Milwaukee or you'll drive to someplace else in Wisconsin or someplace where a midwife can do your breach delivery. And yeah. you'll get an Airbnb and you'll live in uh, Airbnb for three weeks until your baby comes. Um, that sort of thing. If you have, if you're lucky enough to live close enough to the, I do. Wisconsin, so that's a great. Wisconsin I live border, 45 right? minutes from the Wisconsin border, right. so I'm like, wait, uh, yeah, there's I know an the idea. Area. I mean, I have family <laughs> in Chicago and in and in Wisconsin. So, um, and I'm from Minnesota originally, so we did that drive all the time. But, mm-hmm. um, right. But yeah, you might have to. You might have to travel. I mm-hmm. mean, I have people coming out here. It's a big schlep for them to do it. I have a lady here who just came from Nigeria. And I have another one that came from Pennsylvania. They both have twins. They're both due in the next two months. And they're, they moved out here. And one of them is living in an Airbnb. The other one's living with family because they have family in Southern California. And they're going to stay here till have their twins because they were given no choices where they were. Right. Right. And twin right. birth is like a whole nother topic. But that's another thing that a lot of people aren't given options on. It's like you have twins, you're going to have a C-section. Right. That's it. And you're going to have it at 37 weeks, which is, which is a whole nother right. top. It is. Another, I mean, look, at there's so many times, but women need to take back the power. They're not going to listen to me and they're not going to listen to midwives. Yeah. Right. We're, 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 we don't have the political power. We don't have the lobbying power. We don't have the financial power to do that sort of thing. So, but women do, but women in general do. And it may, it may take somebody changing the course of their, their life by becoming an, uh, an organizer or an ad- uh, advocate for this sort of thing. Right. You know, I don't know what's going to happen with the, the next phase of my life. I'm, I'm going to take a sabbatical next year and take some time off. I've been doing birthing and I've been on call for over, over you know, 36 years 
um, pretty much every day. So yeah, that's a lot. I'm going to take some time <laughs> off, and maybe maybe my my next calling will be to teach and to maybe agitate a little bit. I don't know. Yeah, we'll see. revolutionize, we'll see. breach, or it could be to find, a, or it could be to find a you know a small farm in North Dakota and never come out. Again. Right. Yeah, <laughs> that's living the dream, man. <laughs> yeah. We talk about yeah. that all the time, um, my husband and I, but it'd be hard you know, to move away from family. Everybody everybody does, and everybody says exactly the same thing. Yeah. It's hard to move away from what you know. The inertia is a great uh, immobilizer. Mm-hmm. Um, you, don't want, you, you don't want to leave those things behind that matter. Uh, and so you put up with the things that, that are in, really intolerable Yeah, and, and absurd. Yeah, for breach, sure. Breach, breach, breach birth isn't one of them. It's not intolerable. It's not absurd. Breach birth is a variation of normal, and it's beautiful to watch. Yeah. And in skilled hands, the safety uh, and um, the outcomes are are as good, uh, you know, as statistically speaking, as a head down vaginal birth, a vaginal birth. So there you go. Yeah. So ask questions of your physician, and if you get and you go to see a physician, and and he doesn't have time for your questions, or she doesn't you know, give you straight answers or she's not looking you in the eye or she's spending the whole time talking to you while she's typing in her computer at the same time or something like that. Run away. Yeah. Run away. Get a second opinion. Seek something out. Don't stick to something because you've been doing that way for so long. You know, Mm -hmm. this is a, this is a guy, as I said, you know, this more than I do. I've had four children, but the birth of your child is, there's nothing like it. And you should, it should be a memory that you enjoy the rest of your life because it will be with you the rest of your life. Yeah. Yeah. I'm actually looking forward to giving birth again. I've been, my first one was a little bit traumatic, but, um, I'm really looking forward to, to this yeah, second it won't time around. Be. This, the second one, by the way, the second birth is like, I always call it a different species. I don't know. Maybe you've heard me say that, uh, multips are a different species than, primates. oh, for sure. Yeah. So you can, uh, you can watch the d- documentary heads up the disappearing out of breach delivery. You can find me at birthing instincts.com or at birthing instincts on Instagram. And then what's the name of your podcast? Oh, Birthing Instincts podcast. There you go. Right. Yeah. yeah. So if yeah, you guys want to... Bliss, Bliss and I do a podcast once a week, and we have a lot of fun doing it. And Bliss is a, a midwife uh, extraordinaire with a lot of vision and a lot of intuition. She's great. So people will get a kick out of it. Yeah. So if you want to hear more about what Dr. Stu talks about, definitely check out his podcast. And I will link... Um, the website, the Instagram, the podcast, everything in the show notes. And I just want to thank you so much for your time today and your expertise in coming on, coming on the Miraculous Mama show. Thank you, Liz, for having me. I'm going to have links to everything in the show notes, um, his website, the um, birthing documentary, the breach one, and uh, his Instagram and podcast. All that's going to be linked in the show notes. <laughs> He's, he's a great podcast to listen to, too. Um, he and his partner on the podcast just have tons of information, and it's great to kind of scroll through and look for something that maybe you want to learn about and click on that topic and listen. Um, as you all know, I'm a big fan of podcasts. <laughs> I listen to tons of podcasts, and I think that it's um, it's awesome, and I love promoting other podcasts birthing podcast or mom podcast because it's not a competition. We all have bring our own thing to it and we all um, have our niche area maybe that we're passionate about and we a lot of us cover the same topics, but we ask different questions. So it's it's fun. It's been awesome this last couple of years connecting with other mommy podcasters and I've stayed in touch with a lot of them and uh, just kind of, you know, lifting each other up. Because there's room. There's room for everyone. <laughs> uh, you can tell I've been watching Elf too much because my thought was there's room for everyone on the nice list. My daughter is currently obsessed with Elf. So she has never sat and like watched anything. And then she became obsessed with Santa. And now every day she points at the TV and goes, Danta, Danta, Danta. That's all she wants. Um, so it definitely helps during you know, dinner time when I'm trying to cook dinner and Vito's working in the basement and she just loves like the beginning part of it. So I'm like, okay, I can put Santa on. She can watch TV for a little bit. Um, but we're trying to not have it on all day long. Um, but it's also great to know that she loves that movie. So when baby number two comes around and if I'm like, holy crap, I just need a break for whatever, an hour, I can just throw on Elf and it can entertain her for a little bit 
while she usually watches it and destroys the living room with all of her toys. (laughs) So (laughs) we're all in this together. Um, So yeah, I hope everybody's staying healthy. I know that COVID has been going rampant through a lot of different places. Like I know so many people here who have it, who have gotten it, who are, it's just like spreading like wildfire where we live. I know the same things in Vegas where my friends live. Um, and it's just kind of going around like crazy. So I hope everyone's staying happy and healthy and strong and just uplifting each other, loving each other. Although we have different opinions, I know everybody's navigating this situation differently. So just respecting each other and loving on each other, no matter what, you don't have to agree with everything everybody's doing. So, um, so yeah. Make sure that we are doing that. Welcome to 2022 Miraculous Moms Podcast. I love you. I'll talk to you next week. If you want to be the most interesting person at the cocktail party, well, hop on over and listen to the Brain Candy Podcast. Our award-winning content will have you laughing while you're learning. We read all the best articles, books, and studies, and keep up with new TV shows, documentaries, and pop culture. And then we cram it all into two shows a week. Conspiracy theories, cannibal rabbits, unsolved mysteries, the history of the Walkman. There's something for everyone. The Brain Candy Podcast. Find our link in the show notes. Or simply search for the Brain Candy Podcast on your podcast app.